So as I know it, one of you has a birthday right around here. So mine, mine after hers. And you have yours after hers, and yours is coming up, that's February? No, January. January, oh, I was wrong. January, okay. So how old are you now? She's gonna be. You're gonna be four. Now is that Tuesday? No. Wednesday. December. And then I'm gonna be. Wait, what? December. December. December, yeah. And then I'm gonna be eight after hers. And you're gonna be eight. So you're gonna be four and you're gonna be eight. That's awesome. Now, a birthday is a great day because that's a day to thank the Lord for the past year he's given you. Now, think, think hard. This past year that the Lord has given you, this year that he's given you and blessed you to live, do you have a favorite, a favorite memory from this year? Your favorite thing that happened this past year? Uh, this year, this year when, we, when I went on a roller coaster. Ooh, very fun. But, but I couldn't go on the one that the other, like one that was a, a, like the same one, but it was, it was like, a different version of it, but I couldn't because I'm not tall enough. I was almost yeah. tall enough. Almost tall I enough. I could do my tippy toes and I could be tall enough. Ah, well maybe next year. But you did get to go on a roller coaster. Yeah. And that was your highlight? That was sad. That was like, yeah. like when it stopped, you, were, you felt like you were like golden. Yeah, yeah. It's a good thing for those seat belts, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. So that's an experience that you were blessed to be able to have. Luna, do you have a favorite memory? Sometimes I. One day, um, a long time ago, um, me and Abby and my whole, and my whole family went to the um, Wolf Lodge. The Wolf Lodge? Yeah. Yeah? That was really fun. That was really fun? Awesome. So that's a blessing from the Lord. So you have, so you have had a chance to reflect on the past year and really be thankful to God for what he's allowed you to go through and, and be a part of. You've also been able to grow and learn, which is awesome. We've had a year with you guys, a little more than that too. And you guys have been able to grow more and learn about Jesus too. Those are things to be thankful for. Birthdays are also a time to also pray and ask for the Lord's blessing on the next year. What's he got in store for you this next year in your fourth year? in your eighth year. What's he going to do? It's exciting. Can I tell you what birthday cake I'm going to have when it's my birthday? Sure. What birthday cake are you going to have? I'm going to have a spirit birthday cake. A spirit birthday cake? Is that a, is that a horse? Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. <laughs> so maybe that'll be your, your top highlight for next year. <laughs> I'm going to have an ice cream cake. Ice cream cake? Oh, now you're getting me hungry. <laughs> okay, I'm hungry. Now, this month is also the month of Christmas, which is another birthday. Mine is after Christmas. Yours is after Christmas. Yeah, I'm not talking about your birthday now. I'm talking about the other birthday. Whose birthday is Christmas? No, not hers. Not yours. That's right. It's in the name. Christmas. Jesus. It's Jesus' birthday. <laughs> so you celebrate on your birthday being alive for four years. You celebrate on yours being alive for eight. Jesus celebrates being in the flesh, having been born and come to this world for somewhere around 2,024 years, somewhere around there. That's a long time. 2,024 years? Around there, give or take a couple of years. <laughs> so Jesus is really old, <laughs> even in the flesh. But we look for this month as a year to thank God for the gift of Jesus. Because on Jesus' birthday, he was a gift to the world. We talked about that a little bit last week. So today, I thank God that we have a soon-to-be four-year-old and soon-to-be eight-year-old and soon-to-be 2,000-and-something-year-old, Jesus in the flesh. But as God forever year old, if you want me to confuse you again. No, so, so we can be thankful for those things. Day, no confusing you. <laughs> well, I confuse myself sometimes, so I don't know about that. But the whole point that I'm making here is that this Christmas season is supposed to be a time to thank God for Jesus and his birthday. So I want to celebrate Jesus' birthday as well. So let's, uh, let's go to prayer real quick so you guys can go down and learn more about Jesus. And you're going to go with Edie again this morning. So let's pray. So hands together, heads bowed. Let me just talk to God. Father, thank you for these two precious girls. 
Thank you, Lord, for the years of life that you have given them. We pray for many more years that you would just bless them and show them your goodness. They can taste and see that you are good as they dive into ice cream cake and eventually a spirit cake she's hoping for. <laughs> but God, we thank you so much for, the, for your goodness. We just pray for your blessing upon the time they have with Edie. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go with Edie. But today, we're, content we're continuing off of last week to talk about, essentially, that Jesus is the man. <laughs> last week, we talked about how Jesus is God. And uh, we phrased it this way. Jesus, eternally begotten of the Father, which means Jesus eternally existed and is reliant upon his Father. Now, see if you can understand that. Chew on that for a little while but eternally begotten of the Father. Jesus is God. We looked at John 1 for that, about how he was in the beginning before anything else was created. He himself existing before anything was created. How he was with God and how he was God. So Jesus is God. Not just any God. He is the God that created everything, John 1, 3 tells us. It says, apart from him, not anything was made that was made. So if anyone ever tries to tell you that Jesus was created by his Father, you point them to that verse and say, no, not anything was made that wasn't made by Jesus. So there's the truth there. But as we talk about the divinity of Christ, if we talk about how he is our God, we also have to talk about what he did over 2,000 years ago, right? Jesus was born a man somewhere around 6 B.C. We're not quite certain, give or take a couple years either way, but around that time, which is crazy. God became man. So this week, what I, what I want to do is I want to talk about the implications of this. I'm going to talk about what it means that God became flesh, took on flesh. What it means, John 1.14, that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. What that really means. What did it mean that Jesus was man? Is he still man? And why did he do it? <laughs> we could talk about all that today. But doing that, I'm going to be... I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture this morning. Going to be bouncing around a lot. So uh, it's not going to be really possible for you to follow along with me. The goal really is I want to give you guys a brief overlook of what the scriptures have to say about the manhood of Jesus. And if I hit a passage I'm going to be on for a little while, I'll, I'll let you guys turn there so you can follow along somewhat. But I just want you to be aware uh, you're not really going to be able to turn that fast. Maybe some of you will, but if so... Uh, we need to do some world championships. Have you represent our church? <laughs> but we're going to talk about scriptural proof for the humanity of Christ. So first and foremost, to be a human, you have to be born. <laughs> and we know Jesus was born. Matthew 1.23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Luke 2, 7 is then the fulfillment of that promise. And the virgin gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And then, of course, John 1, 14 makes it clear that the word became flesh. Jesus was born. So born as a man. This also means that if he was born as a baby, he had to grow. He aged. Not only did he age, not only did he age, he grew and he even learned in the flesh. Luke 2.52 puts it this way. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, that's interesting, right? In the flesh, though he is God and knows everything in the flesh, Limited in knowledge. In fact, he grew. He didn't come out of the womb of Mary and start speaking in complete sentences. He didn't come out of the womb of Mary and start doing a line dance. No, he had to learn to walk. He had to learn to talk. He grew in knowledge as a man. So truly human in that way, he took on that limitation of limited knowledge in the flesh. But also, on top of that, it says he increased in favor with God. How does that work? Well, 
I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea by this. It's not saying that, Jesus, that, that God's love for Jesus grew. That's not possible. He couldn't love Jesus any less or any more. What it's saying is as Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and age, he was able to take on more and more from the Father. The Father entrusted him with more and more. And as he reached his, his time for his, for his earthly ministry, he was entrusted with even more knowledge and even more abilities than what was average for the average man. So he grew in favor in that way and what God entrusted him to be able to do as a man in the flesh. That's what it means by he grew in favor with God. And of course, when you see somebody who has favor with God, who's able to do miraculous things and able to speak miraculous truths, then he starts to grow in favor with man as well. He starts to gain some renown for better or for worse. So he grew, he aged, he learned. But it wasn't all sunshine and roses either. He didn't just get the good sides of men, he also got the bad. Not talking about sin, though. We're going to get to that. But it means he also thirsted and hungered. He also was tempted and tried. Luke 4.2 talks about him in the wilderness. It says, for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. So here we have Jesus being tempted. On top of that, he's, being, he's also growing hungry because he doesn't have food. So truly, he took on the weakness of the flesh. On top of that, though, I want you to make clear, while he was man, while he was tempted and tried in all ways as we are, he was without sin. So we call this the... Um, we, we can't ignore the fact that on one end Jesus is man, but we can't ignore that he is also God. And as such, he is considered a holy child who cannot sin. Here's what... Uh, in Luke 1.35... It says, the angel answered and said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. Jesus was holy from birth, without sin, not born into sin. That was the one major difference between him and other men. He was not born in iniquity. 1 John 3, 5 puts it clearly. You know that Jesus appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. So Jesus was without sin. But to bring that all together, tempted and tried yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest, a representative before God, who is Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who has been tempted and tried in all things as we are, yet without sin. So, he was tempted and tried, he thirsted and he hungered, yet without sin. On top of that, as a man, Jesus also grew weary and tired. He even slept. In fact, it says after a long journey, if you remember the woman at the well, well before that, the word says in John 4, 6, Jesus being wearied, exhausted from his traveling, exhausted from his journey, sat down by the well. Physically, he grew tired, he grew weary. Matthew 8, 24 even says that even in the midst of a busy and crazy storm, he slept in the boat. So truly, he was man in many different ways. Which also meant that he took on limited knowledge, but also limited presence. He couldn't be in multiple places at once in the flesh. John eleven twenty one. 21, uh, this woman named Martha, who was a friend of Jesus, was, was upset with Jesus because he couldn't be at all places at the same time. She said, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Because in the flesh, Jesus could only be one place at a time. He really did limit himself in many ways in the flesh. Now, if you want to follow along a little bit for these next few points of Jesus' manhood, Luke, uh, you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 22, verse 63. So we see Jesus didn't only become man, he became mortal man in the flesh. With many different limitations, he grew tired, but this also means that Jesus could be felt, he could be touched, which also means he could be grabbed, he could be restricted, he could be overpowered, and he could be blinded even. 
as we find here in Luke chapter 22, verse 63. Now, the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who hit you? Like I said, Jesus becoming man was not sunshine and roses. He felt agony, both mentally and physically. He both sweat and he bled. Same chapter, but a little before that, verse 44. Jesus in the garden, he's preparing for this kind of stuff to happen. He's preparing to undergo torture, to be betrayed by man. And so in 44 it says, And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. This is not figurative language. This is an actual thing that happens under deep stress where stress can cause your blood vessels around your sweat glands to rupture and blood will mix with your sweat. It's some long medical word that I can't remember off the top of my head now. But that's what was happening to Jesus. It's hematidrosis, actually. But he both sweat, he bled, and he felt deep stress, mental, physical, and spiritual stress as a man. So truly, he understands our sorrows. And if he can undergo all that, he also could die. Luke 23, 46. Turn over there. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So Jesus was born as a man, felt all the things, experienced all the things that a man could feel, all except for sin, and of course the guilt of committing sin. But he lived as a man and he died as a man. He was buried as a man as well. Luke 23, 53. And he took, and he took down the body of Jesus and wrapped it in linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever, had ever lain. So he died and he was buried. But then we have the question. So Jesus lived on this earth as a man. But what about the resurrected Jesus? Was the resurrected Jesus man? Turn over with me to Luke chapter 24, verse 36. The resurrected Jesus. It says, while the disciples were telling these things, they're talking about their experiences with the resurrected Jesus so far, trying to make sense of it. Then Jesus himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. So they thought that this resurrected Jesus was not man, was not in the flesh. But he said to them, verse 38, Why are you troubled? And why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So even in resurrection, Jesus still has flesh and bone. He is still man, but no longer mortal man. He will no longer taste death, but he knows eternal life. But he shows them clearly that his flesh and bone, he even shows them that this body has nail marks and the feet and hands. He says, see my hands and feet, touch them. And when he said this, verse 40, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of world fish and he took it and he ate it before them. So still man, with flesh and blood, flesh and bone, and still man who's able to eat, which also means that he was still limited in presence to that body in the flesh. Luke, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 1. 
I want, to, I want you to see this. Acts chapter 1. I want you to see that to this day, Jesus still has kept the flesh. We're going to go to verse 9 in Acts chapter 1. So Acts 1, 9, And after Jesus had said these things to his disciples, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you bodily into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So he went up into heaven bodily, and he will return in his second coming bodily, in the flesh. But while he is limited in bodily presence, he still has a divine presence. We call this the hypostatic union for, the, for those theology geeks here. But essentially that while Jesus is man and, and is limited to all the things that man is limited, at the same time he is also God and is unlimited as God is unlimited. So while he is bodily in heaven with the Father at his right side, and there only bodily, he can also be with his disciples wherever they go. His, some of his last words to his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, he says, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is able to say that to them. I'll be with you always. And then goes up to heaven, away from them. <laughs> because he is the God-man. Now, even in heaven, he is still referred to as a man while he is with the Father. 1 Timothy 2.5, as, as Paul is talking about him, Paul, an apostle filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking under direct inspiration and guidance from God, says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus bodily is our mediator. I'm going to get into why that has to be the case in one second. But though he is man, he also has a glorious body. He shows us bodily what we shall become. Not that we will become God. We will never become him in Godhood. But we will become him in manhood as he is. With glorious body, no longer tasting death. No longer hunger or thirsting or growing weary. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. It says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, awaiting his second coming. Praise the Lord. It says, Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So Jesus, in his glorious body, shows us what we shall become bodily. But why did he do this? Why would he humble himself? Why would he limit himself so much? Why would he undergo all of that? Why was it important that God became man? Surely there could have been another way, right? Well, certainly no other man could have paid for our sins. Hebrews 7, 26 or 27, bear witness to this. It says, For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest as Jesus, who is holy, innocent, undefiled, and separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like human high priest, like sinful high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because Jesus did this once and for all when he offered up himself. See, because here's the thing. The wages of sin is death, our bodily death. <laughs> Hebrews makes it clear in chapter 10 that the blood of bulls and goats, the blood of animals, cannot pay for our sins. So when a high priest goes, and if he were to try to give his life for someone else, he would have to pay the price for his own sin first. How's he going to die for himself and then get up and die for someone else? He has to bear his own punishment. Every man does. So no man is able to pay for their own sins, really, besides just taking on the consequences of sin. And they're certainly not able to pay for the sins of others. So it had to be Jesus. It had to be Jesus and his perfection. But it couldn't just be Jesus as God because God cannot die. And payment for sin 
caused for bodily death, so he had to take on flesh. Hebrews chapter 2, if you want to turn there, you can. But I'm going to go ahead and read it. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to read a few verses from there. But chapter 2, verse 14 through 15 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, since the children of men share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise also partook of flesh and blood, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Every man is slavery to the one thing that every man will share, and that is death. Because we all share sin and its consequences. So Jesus took on flesh that he could pay the price for us. Hebrews 2, 9 puts this also. It says, but we... But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Praise the Lord for Jesus. But he also did this so that he could properly represent man before God. Being still in the body before God now, before the Father, he's able to represent us. Hebrews 2 17 through 18. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation, to make payment for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted." Because he took on flesh, because he understands our struggles, he is able to properly represent us and pay the price for our sins. But it doesn't end there. He also became man so that we might actually have a chance at understanding God even a little bit. Because we couldn't understand God in the slightest bit before Jesus. Philippians 2 verse 5 through 8 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who although he existed in the form of God, if you need a statement that says Jesus is God, there you go, in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing that we could understand, a thing to be grasped. We couldn't understand it. We couldn't even begin to understand who God was, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, of a slave, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus came to reveal to us who God was through the flesh in a way that we could understand. Of course, we can't fully understand who God is, but now we at least have a starting point. We can look at Jesus and see the way he interacted and see the way he acted towards men and moved towards men to understand how God feels about man, how God feels about us what God wants of us, we now can understand through Jesus. Another great reason why he had to become man. And finally, another one reason I want to leave you with is Jesus also served as our example as what we as people, men and women, should be. He was our example in so many different ways for what it truly meant to be human what God truly meant for us when he designed us and created us to be in his image. Philippians 2.5, like what we just read, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He was an example for us of humility, of esteeming others greater than himself, of going out of his way to help others. Matthew 11:29 Jesus says, "Take my yoke, which is saying, take my teaching, take my way of life. Strap in right next to me and walk alongside of me and do what I do is what he's saying. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls Amen. if you do as I do." That's what Jesus is saying. He came Step into our shoes to show us how it's done. What a wonderful God. John 13, 13 through 15. 
He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. That's an I am statement. For I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. We should be servants as Christ was a servant. The, the perfect example of him humbling himself to the form of a man, humbling himself to the form of a slave, was that we ought to serve one another and love one another. Because that's what it truly means to be human as God designed us. In 1 Peter 2.21, my final verse on this point, For you have been called to this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. As we follow Jesus, we follow his example. As we walk in that example and become more and more like him day by day, we will also suffer as he suffered. But it will be worth it because we will also be glorious in bodily form as he is glorious in bodily form. He promises that for all who put their faith in him. So, we know Jesus is God. The scriptures are so clear on that point. But we also know that Jesus is man. And not just any man, he is the man. The go-to man. <laughs> He's the man who, the only man who can pay for our sins, who can set us free from death, who can mediate between God and us, who can be our perfect example, and who can give us a true relationship with God. We can know our God, our creator, because we can know him because he humbled himself to a form that we could understand. And so that's what we come to when we come to the communion table. I want you to remember that Jesus became man, that Jesus took on flesh and broke that flesh and spelt that blood for us that we could know God, paying the price for our sins, that something that only he could do. That's our Jesus, God and man. So if you peel back that first layer, Help out your neighbors if they need it. Look around. There's a chance to wash each other's feet. If you would, take this piece of bread, which represents the body of Jesus, the flesh he took on for you and broke for you. And I'd like someone to ask for the blessing on the bread today. Who would like to do that this morning? Who would like to ask the blessing on the bread? Don't all jump at once. All right, thank you, Gary. Father, we just thank you for this bread here that represents your body, that body that was broken and hung on the cross out of love for us. We just thank you that you loved us that much to sacrifice your son. Again, we give you praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus body broken for you. Let's take together. Now, if you would, peel back this other layer. This juice representing the blood that Jesus spelt for your sins. Now, who would like to ask for God's blessing on the cup this morning? Solvig, would you do that? Precious Lord Jesus, thank you for the price you paid for my redemption. Thank you for the blood that was shed. Mm. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you for all you done for us. We just lavish all your blessings. Yes. Praise the promise. Bless this man, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus, blood spelt for you. Let's take. Father, thank you. We want to definitely thank you today on a, on, a, on a day when we break bread and, and, uh, and share a cup representing Jesus' Jesus's bread, I mean, Jesus' body and blood God spelt for us. The gift of Jesus, that he would humble himself to, to suffer agony, to suffer, to suffer weariness, and all the things that you as God would never experience. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for the birth of Jesus. We praise you this morning. We thank you so much that we as sinners can know you and be called holy because Jesus is holy. In Jesus' name, amen.